Good morning, everyone in Schema Therapy Made Simple. Today we have with us Elizabeth Lacey, um, also known as Liz Lacey. She is coming live from New York. Liz is an advanced schema therapist and an ISST trainer and supervisor. She's a licensed clinical social worker and her specialty and her expertise is in the area of addiction and betrayal trauma. And now Liz has been working for over 20 years with these um, really fascinating areas of clinical work. She has been a clinical supervisor for an addiction treatment team in New York City, and she presents internationally on these topics. So this is a really exciting opportunity for us in schema therapy made simple to have someone here to talk to us about betrayal trauma. Welcome, Liz. Hi, everybody. It's so, so great to be here um, talking about something that uh, is near and dear to my heart, as many of you know. Um, and thank you, Nadine, for asking me to come on and share some thoughts and some treatment mm -hmm. tips. So. Oh, you're be very here. welcome. And just for everyone listening's benefit, Liz came into my world when I listened to a podcast um, about sexual addiction um, behaviours probably a couple of years ago now. And then I found out she was running um, an online course and I couldn't wait to be in it. And then I begged her to be my supervisor and she's still supervising me now. So I'm a big fan <laughs> of Liz's work. And I think, uh, you know, some people have a real gift of, taking schema therapy and making it very warm and accessible, not only to clients, but to learning therapists as well. And Liz, I think you are one of those people. So. Oh, um, thank you. I'm sure everyone listening today will see exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> no but pressure. no pressure no <laughs> pressure <laughs> okay yeah. yeah so um how about if we begin today Liz by explaining um to our listeners and viewers today what betrayal trauma is sure so uh betrayal trauma uh, the term was introduced in the early 90s um uh, particularly in the sexual addiction treatment community, because they're in the past with addictive disorders, right? We were very familiar with the terms enabling and that, right, with, with alcoholism and substance abuse, that it, people can have enablers around them. And with that term comes a little bit of blaming almost mm -hmm. right that mm -hmm. they're they're uh they're ending up adding to the disordered behaviors when normally in sex addiction the partner is completely unaware mm -hmm. so so the trauma that ends up getting done is very very different usually than mm -hmm. alcoholism and substance abuse so they this term kind of became more widely used is the way I would put it. Mm -hmm. And betrayal trauma, essentially, if you just look at the cores, when people you depend on for support um, or protection betray you in a significant pervasive way mm -hmm. and usually of a long duration. So, um, not that a one night stand wouldn't be extremely upsetting, but usually won't get post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms mm -hmm. from that. Mm -hmm. right. Aff affairs all the way into the continuum of sex addiction, where as, as you and I were talking before we went live, um, where your entire life could feel like a lie. You mm -hmm. find out the entire marriage, mm -hmm. even before you met that this person had been seeing sex workers or been having multiple affairs and everything gets shattered. So that's kind of the continuum. Yes. Right. So with betrayal trauma comes a very, very strong sense of shame, even for the betrayed partner, guilt, self-blame. 
So those are the very, very strong emotions usually right away. There's the initial shock. So there's, a, there's also sort of stages people can go through and mm -hmm. just like stages for, for anything else, it, it can be in any order, shock, denial, right? Obsession with it, anger, bargaining, you know, mm. things like that. Okay. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. And so it's really interesting to me that you mentioned the PTSD like reaction. Mm -hmm. um, and certainly I've seen that sort of some of it's the obsessive focus, but it is quite often nightmares and flashbacks. And sometimes it's flashbacks yes. of the telling, but sometimes it's almost intrusive imagery of what was going on sexually with partners and and then sometimes I think that's fed by that need for information that comes and then they get a lot of detail and then they're kind of imagining their partner in all these sexual interactions with another partner or often multiple partners in the sort of work that you're doing and certainly I've come across a little bit of that in my work even though I don't specialize in it um, that's yeah some addictive sexual type behaviors that the extent of um the hypersexuality means there is just a lot of partners involved, not just one. Yeah, that they focus on. Yeah, yeah, and and what's hard at the beginning usually it's uh, what we call it a discovery, right? So usually it's the partner finding out that their partner. That's usually how people end up in treatment. Have been cheating for short or very long periods mm. of time. And sometimes the, we'll, we'll call it the offending partner, the addicted partner, the partner having affairs, will then try to, and I will say, uh, dump some of the guilt, right? They, they're not in any kind of recovery yet. So they don't know a way that is not hurtful and will sometimes dump way too much of the details mm. on the partner who's been hurt without thinking about, of course, without thinking about the result of that. Mm. So it, even, even during the discovery phase, there can be like what we call staggered discovery, which is you find out, oh, they were having an affair with this person uh, uh, during this period of time and they get that amount of information and then three months later find out more and mm. then six months after that find out more usually when there's staggered discovery much higher chance for post-traumatic stress disorder yeah because you can imagine some level of adjustment starts after the first you know that's right like that. and then like oh I can deal with that and then it's like here's another and here's another and I think that right. difficulty of coming to terms with the level of um lying and hiding that's been going on then you know that trust becomes almost irreparably broken in some cases yes um and wh whoever is working with the addicted person has got to like right away do interventions to try to stop that from happening yeah um it's it's really important when you when you do treatment that whoever is working with each person that they coordinate and talk about a uh, sort of a uh, a joint treatment plan if they're staying together mm. um yeah. and the approach for therapists should be go forward as if they're staying together, even though they may not. Mm -hmm. uh, just in order to really do justice to both people, but especially the betrayed partner, because they still, let's say they split up. Once again, do they need that level of detail? Because they're still going to have a traumatic reaction. Like you said, they're all three clusters of post-traumatic stress Mm -hmm. are shown in betrayal trauma if you give them like a pcls i don't know what you guys usually give but for a, yeah. a pcls they will score very very high on that mm -hmm. right yeah. and i um i think it's great that you mentioned the non-blaming to the portrayed partner because that is something i see even in just general affair work where somehow 
you know, you're not having enough sex with him or um, exactly. you haven't kept the novelty yeah. up and all this stuff starts happening. Yes. And it's, it's kind of like, well, perhaps there were um, some things going on in the relationship, but does that really justify a full-scale secret identity and life going on? I mean, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, really quite exactly. questionable. Yeah. 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 Uh, and I can't, I can't tell you how many times I've seen just that. Like mm. you should wear sexier clothes to bed. Meanwhile, he had sex with 150 sex workers. <laughs> so it's like one thing has nothing to absolutely nothing to do. And I with think in, in that case, probably the therapist isn't understanding the nature of the behavior of the, um, well, in Australia, we tend to call it hypersexuality. I know in the US. It's yes, hypersexuality. Yes, it no, no, it, same thing. Yeah. yeah. But they're not mm -hmm. understanding the drivers for that. And it's it's not all about intimacy. So um, a, a partner wearing sexy lingerie isn't competing um, with that. And also, I think, you know, the nature of why people... Um, engage a sex worker and the type of sex that they're going to want to have with them it's it might be something that isn't really negotiable in a intimate relationship and that's not they wouldn't even right. want that from their intimate partner that's right so, yeah and i think it's it's really um but i can only imagine how difficult it is for clients to find specialists in this area because it is so niche it it is um and it could end up doing more damage than mm. good if you don't at least have a good sense of how mm. to approach. Um, in in no way us can we ever give the message that we are blaming the betrayed partner. Mm. It, we have to be very, very clear that the person who did the betraying all of those behaviors are theirs. It, it doesn't. It doesn't matter how much. Uh, e even if we, we see very dysfunctional modes within the betrayed partner, even within that, it doesn't matter. Mm. Still, those behaviors were hidden mm. and are theirs. Yeah, that's right. And you know, I'm just thinking of one couple that I worked with back when I used to work with couples and. Um, the betrayed partner was very much like, I don't understand. I'm having sex with him all the time. Like, what else am I supposed to do? And, and he still had this secret stuff going on. And, and it was really about looking at what the function of that was for him and, you know, really yep. come to the conclusion that it wasn't her fault because I think she felt like somehow, and I guess that's the narrative out there for women in general, that if you're meeting yep. the needs of your partner, they're not going to stray. But I think history has shown that's probably not true um, for, for many yes. Yeah. 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 Hey, totally. Absolutely. Um, and, and we also, we have to be careful when we're doing psychoeducation um, with the betrayed partner, even trying to see and understand why he, I want to say he or she, right, or they, mm. just to be clear, this could be yeah. any combination of any mm. gender, right, um, could be, uh, wait, where was I going with that? So um, that, right, I lost my train of thought, oh, sorry. I was talking about the non-blaming and. Um, yes. Yes. The, the non-blaming and right. And so we don't want to, hmm, I'm still losing my train of thought with this one. We'll come back Sorry to guys. <laughs> Sorry about um, that. Yeah. yeah. Cause right. Cause I wanted to get, I wanted to get to, right. We don't, right. We don't want to ever blame. Um, and we want to be careful if we're identifying the modes, right. The modes, cause we're definitely going to want to do this for the betrayed partner because there are certain modes that, will get triggered in mm -hmm. them that can make things much much worse for okay. them okay and in your yeah. experience what are those modes that um then make recovery from this extremely painful so at the beginning um 
Well, I'll talk about treatment in a second. The two, I would say the two modes that are the most common are what I would call sort of a detective mode. They're both overcompensation modes, but this detective mode to try to keep themselves safe. So to be checking everything, where they're going, when they're in the bathroom, um, what they're doing online, where their phone is, mm -hmm. where is their car parked, everything. Right. So there's a detective mode. There's um, what I would call like a, a critical over controller mode mm -hmm. that can happen where because of the anger, right, the hyper arousal that's involved, like uh, a lot of venting what will look like cruelty right. to the betraying you know the betraying yeah. partner um and then third which is less common and actually i find more difficult to work with is mm -hmm. going into a detached protector mode of some sort okay. like well you know all men they you know what they look at porn it's not that big a deal you know i can you know, I, I'm, I have too many other things on my plate. I really don't want to think about this now. This is not my problem. This is his problem, which it's true, mm. but, but, but they're going into a detached mode. So all of that pain and horror is going underground mm. um, and they're getting further and further away from any kind of intimacy for themselves too. Um, and they're staying in a situation which is 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 really unhealthy. Mm -hmm. So um, their needs won't be met there. So I would say those are the three that are the most common. Right. And certainly I think I've seen all of them with um, yeah. betrayed partners. And um, it's interesting yep. that you find the overcompensating modes easier than the, the detachment. But I guess it's because there's very little emotion and energy in those. So that it can be quite hard to... Uh, hook into things but hmm they and pl plus the the detached mode they don't stay in treatment <laughs> yeah um th yeah. they'll avoid they avoid treatment because it brings up the feelings for sure so lots of cancellation so it's it's also it's hard to help that's why i find it more challenging absolutely um and you can see how protective it is for them and and um Sometimes I wonder if there's a delayed reaction then. So they've used that detached protector mode, um, but then a year later, because the mode's only going to hold up for so long, yes. generally. Yeah. That's right. Generally, what you'll see is it'll last like that for six, sometimes six months, and mm -hmm. then something will happen where that will say the that 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 inner house of cards falls sure. something and they'll get triggered mm -hmm. and and then it'll all come up and in your experience is that um mode useful for people if they want to stay in the relationship because there's perhaps children or or is this still present in people who leave i'd say it's most common in people who stay it is it really i think is about just maintaining the life that they have mm. particularly if they don't feel like it would be very easy to leave i mean and yeah. there's all sorts of reasons for that absolutely yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah i mean i find to be very honest financial reasons is usually the number one and of course because that's yeah. about safety and survival so um right that's probably the the biggest um reason and even you know when we're saying children it's often because well the children's safety and survival will be affected financially by all of this so yeah right yeah that's right that's right and is there anything else yeah. that you think is really important um for those who are joining us either live or in the recording to know about betrayal trauma um i I don't think so. I, I think that, you know, really the main thing is to, to avoid those pitfalls that it's very easy to get into it also to try to make sure that at the beginning, and when I say the beginning, I'm going to say like the first eight weeks of treatment mm -hmm. that we're not too quick 
to put limits on the anger. There's go it's going to feel like we want to because the anger is often very intense, but they've just been hit by a bus usually when this happens. They've got to be able to talk about the anger they feel and how much they they hate him. Uh, I'll, I'll just use that for yeah. shorthand, they, how much they hate him and they want to leave and they don't want to stay. Let them vent all the feelings, right? Mm -hmm. Try not to, to, to steer them in any one direction yeah. at the beginning. Well, I guess if you do that, you're literally asking them to go into an avoidant mode, aren't you? Like, don't yes, that stuff. And I find that anger is something that a lot of therapists need to get better at, um, allowing agreed to express yeah so you, yeah. Can, you could even put someone not not totally your fault but you can almost encourage depression i think because they're going to have to freeze to not feel yeah and, uh, yeah so the anger right. is, is good and i see it as um it's really defending them isn't it and and it's really coming yeah. into contact with the um what do I call it the boundary crossing that they've experienced and so if they can't stand up for themselves that way and we go oh you know um, maybe don't use those words in our session or trying to encourage some forgiveness too early if you're into that exactly sort of stuff. I'm not so much into right that. I know some therapists are yeah really no forgiving. right <laughs> yeah I could yeah. see how that would happen so that's really important so just to to paraphrase you there to allow the anger allow all the feelings and that could be quite prolonged it's not a two yes. session. Oh, I'm furious. It's, it just can right. be a bit longer than some other things. Exactly. Yeah. And then, and then with, and then with that detective mode, the part of it that at the beginning they'll need to keep is they should have access to the emails and text messages and and mm -hmm. anything that they want to have access for at least the first several mm -hmm. months if not the first full year of treatment and they should be allowed common, to have um, that one that's common that i've um, come across is access to bank accounts credit card statements you know yep. when services are being purchased that's right anyway so um yes and um i mean i think also something i picked up is you really recommend working separately not couples therapy in the beginning yes um because there's a well so it depends on where on the continuum the betrayal happened sometimes if it's if it's one affair mm -hmm. which Again, sometimes you don't get a betrayal trauma reaction to that. Sometimes you do. It depends on the person's history. But if it's sex addiction, to put the partner, the betrayed partner, either one, but especially betrayed partner in a couple situation, there's there's no there's no ability to trust yet they're not really in recovery yet they're likely to relapse at that point so mm. you're asking someone to be vulnerable in an unsafe situation right i get it um right. and i think something i've seen is that punishing mode you know that overly critical one yeah they bring the um partner to therapy because they also don't trust that they're going to go to therapy without them. And they also want, you know, almost like to triangle with the therapist to create this whole situation. Yes. So that's quite true. That's right. It yeah. is. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so I, I think that's something that probably doesn't happen that much in Australia. I think quite often people are straight away recommended into couples work and it sounds like it's just too soon. Um, yes. Um, I think really what it does is kind of create equal responsibility for the situation as well. And what you've been saying this whole time is actually it's not exactly. an equal responsibility here. So no. quite important, that tip. Um, one thing I've noticed um, with clients who are engaging in affairs or secret hidden sexual relationships is quite often mm -hmm. they go through the phase of um this is really unfair and um they my partner's being really mean and 
when's it going to end and enough of this now like they don't have a lot of tolerance for being in kind of the responsible chair <laughs> for and I'm yes wondering if you've got any ideas about like what a therapist role is with that stuff yeah so uh, so a therapist working with the offending partner mm. the person with the hypersexual mm. mode um has got to do a lot of empathy work with them mm. um with, without doing a lot of empathy work uh you, you're they're you, they're not going to get very far right they're not going to be able to really re what call relationship restoration they're not going to be able to restore that relationship right. um if they're not able to hear uh, there's a lot of emphasis at the beginning on listening to your partner's anger mm -hmm. for we tell, we tell people this it's it's probably going to if you stay sober if you if you stay mm -hmm. in recovery it's going to probably be a year before this starts to really get better yeah so right you've got to prepare for that yeah and actually that's what i say to people is like um i'm sure it's really difficult but in the yeah. context of what's happening this is normal and this is what your partner needs and you're going to have yes. to find a way to handle this like it's um yes part of this i i do imagery i will actually I do. do um Yes, present day imagery with them and and walk them through it and almost almost do like an exposure if they're having difficulty tolerating it. And you can imagine if the person you know like the discoveries happen, they are feeling a lot of shame mm. usually. So you know their own shame and wanting to push it away is a lot of why how long do i have to listen to this because every time they hear it the guilt comes up and their own shame and they you know it's hard to tolerate it so doing some imagery work can really help with that so that's really useful because i think on the outside it looks very um dismissive and entitled and yeah um, you know, really what it is is yeah. just a mode that's there to avoid feeling deep shame. And and I guess yes. the secrecy, I mean, it's, the secrecy is probably there for different functions, but one of them is to avoid shame. And, you know, even someone that I'm yes. working with at the moment, different situation, but it was a bit like a session like, you know, that meme you see around that says, oh, my therapist is doing great. If only she knew all the secrets I was hiding from her. It was one of those sessions where I finally got the secrets. And I was very gently like, it's really interesting to me we've worked for two years and you never mentioned this and and it's and they disclosed that it was because of the shame and they said I've actually been doing that with my friends as well I've hidden this from literally yeah. everyone because then if I have to yeah. think about what's actually going on it's too painful so yeah I think that's yeah. a really um really good thing thinking about sometimes the behavior in the offending partner um, is to avoid shame and probably their addictive behavior it is. to toxic shame it is it, yeah. it, there's no question um mm -hmm. even the even people who are really in the most entitled mind frames when they when they drop that mm -hmm. there is usually yeah deep defectiveness shame mm -hmm. Yeah, great. Um, loneliness so, too, a lot of loneliness. Sure. So we do have some pre-submitted questions for today and I'll just, yeah. I know we've got some people live. If you want to put your post uh, questions in the comments, I'm nice. quite terrible at looking at them, but I will do my best today <laughs> to catch them. Yeah. So I'll start with the questions that were pre-submitted and if any pop in, I'll, um, I'll put those in as we go along. So what are the best ways that you found Liz to help clients recover um, and heal those intrusive symptoms, the PTSD like symptoms? The two most effective ways are going to be either exposure or imagery rescripting. Right. So, right. So with, with exposure, Oh, I hear a little echo. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just trying to get the comments and it's turning on the, sound that's me oh the sound sorry, yeah. <laughs> okay sorry right. anyway that's sorry, okay everyone. i just heard a little i heard myself speak there for a second um <laughs> it was real so 
Yeah, yes, exactly. So so with ex exposure, if, if you're if they're really having just um, an intensive, intrusive thought, uh, um, so uh, or image. So, for example, someone I worked with. So they're still together, right? If mm. you're thinking they're still together in the same apartment. And now when he is in bed and he's got his phone right now, discoveries happen. He's in recovery. He's just talking to his sponsor, but she knows that, that was a time when he was in a hypersexual mode in the past. That's when he would be on with sex workers. Mm. It, she, she would see him and Oh no, we've got a freeze happening. Hopefully this is going to come back to us. Okay. Um, oh, sorry, you, it's frozen. It's Hi. It's frozen. It's okay. Oh, hang on a second. I'm going to, <laughs> let me just see if I can switch to something else. Hold on one sec. Let's see if this works. It's yeah, not it's even not switching I think everyone can see us. It just went for a little bit. So you were talking about exposure. Okay. The imagery right. and so, here. Yeah. Right. So um so when they're right, so they get all these details and now in their minds they they are realized so one of my patients would realize that when her partner was in the bed with the with the phone. Mm -hmm she would she would all all of a sudden be triggered into reliving discovery right. so right so i just did a slow exposure of walking her through that right I imaginally over and over and over again right um and just like any other exposure right and then the anxiety goes down and she can tolerate it again and it's right. okay you would use imagery imagery rescripting um be very clear about what is the conclusion they're coming to within that image mm -hmm. so that you can rescript the right part of that. Right. So what so I mean some right preparation by, there to know yes what the either the schema or the core belief is and make sure that exactly that changes with that them. that is what you're targeting in yeah. the imagery rescripting. Yeah. That's okay. that those two are very effective for that cluster. Great. Okay, yeah. great. Um, yeah. And how does someone recover from the pain of feeling like the love in their relationship wasn't real? Um, yeah. Sometimes people really think they're with the love of their lifetime and they're having this very yeah. special um, monogamous yeah. relationship and it's just not that. Yeah. But here, here's what's hard and this uh there's some people who might even be listening to this might balk when i say this some of these things mm -hmm. so th there's a couple things the first is education around modes with the betrayed partner so they're going to be learning about their own modes and you can link that to their partner also has these modes right and that when they're in one frame of mind a certain mode which is their home mode that aspect of them is not necessarily not real mm. it's real in that aspect but generally addicted people especially around sex or in this hypersexual mode they like flip a switch and they're in this other life there's this whole other persona that that comes over them in mm. which you don't exist really right i, I know that's a, that's part of the shock but it's it's not exactly that the love wasn't real mm. It's that the love exists within certain modes and it it's really, really very compartmentalized with thick walls mm. between these modes. Yeah, yeah. If, if you know what I mean. Yeah, and I think um, 
I mean, although the, the you know, other... in this world we talk about parts of self and stuff, but I do find yeah. that outside of therapy, a lot of people still want to see someone as having a completely homogenous sort of self. And so this idea is quite difficult to tolerate. But I know even for someone that I'm working with at the moment who's the betrayed um, partner, that that uh, uh, that description you've given is going to be very helpful because it's super painful to think it wasn't real and I was completely tricked yeah. because then you feel foolish as well. It's like actually you say, well, yeah. it was real. They just couldn't do it consistently and then they flip into these other parts that are also real. Yes. Um, yeah, you're not aware of. Yes. So, yeah. So there's that. Then there's this uh, one other thing, which is common too, is if the person they're involved with also happens to be narcissistic, sometimes this great love is actually a rescue mode. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, and I think that's something that you've yeah. explained to me before in supervision. I think it would be really helpful for people to hear about because it does explain also our clients that we see um, repeatedly, repeatedly partnering with the same kind of person. Yes. They right. are, um, their contribution, if anything, is that kind of please save me, um, perhaps some immaturity yeah. in their personality where they, you know, the narcissist comes along and thinks I'm going to take you under my wing and, um, yeah. which is always obvious to people um, when they first start working with these sorts of things. Yeah. And, and as they start to recognize this, what can be triggered is a lot of guilt and self-blame, mm. right? If they start to recognize within themselves this desire to be rescued, the desire to be rescued has nothing to do with what the partner did to them no. right and i just want to write yeah, we, so we're we not there blaming. To be very careful yeah we're no not blaming but it's right. sort of an explanation for how these pairings kind of often repeat multiple yeah. times mm. absolutely so that so this right this rescue mode is this overcompensation mode i think i probably said it to you this way it's uh for those old enough or aware enough to remember Mighty Mouse, that cartoon, there was a cartoon Mighty Mouse. That is going back. <laughs> uh, that is going way, it's, it's before my time. But I just remember the theme song was, here I am to save the day. Right? <laughs> right? Often, oftentimes that, uh, that was a role that they took in childhood right? That, that they were going to rescue the family. They were the star, yeah. right? Th they were the ones to be the, 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 um, uh, you know, the best child, the perfect child. And that was their role. They're continuing that role. It feels good to them. And they go into perfect boyfriend, perfect girlfriend, right? Perfect lover mm -hmm. role. And it feels wonderful. And I know that that is a mode that people with a hypersexual mode who have a lot of affairs will often mm -hmm. go into. Right. Yeah. That's how they get affair partners. They're mm -hmm. going to rescue the other person from all their bad relationships, all their pain. And who, who wouldn't want that? Right. Right. Yeah. And so it feels like the best love of your life, especially if you haven't known real love. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a really good explanation. And I think also sometimes why um, the narcissistic partner is so offended that the other, you know, when said, but you should be grateful because I've literally rescued you and given you this, you know, yes. really hard, and now you're complaining. <laughs> right. So, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Right. right. Yeah, um, yeah. And so this is a question from one of our group members. Uh, yeah. If a couple decide to rebuild after a betrayal, um, yeah. are there any approaches or provisions you'd make when betrayal happens in a hurtful way a second time? So I guess they're already supposedly on the way to recovery and then there's a relapse, I guess we could call it from an addiction perspective. Yeah, a relapse. Um, right. And yeah, what are the key treatment approaches you apply in those situations? So 
the first thing is anticipating it. So when you're working with the betrayed partner, you want to at some point talk about the possibility that there could be, well, we just use the word relapse, relapse in the behavior, um, that there's the possibility because they'll ask you, what if they're still lying to me? What if, what if they do it again? Or we, there's no guarantee. Mm. Um, there is the chance that that could happen. If that happened again, to, to talk about how the partner would want to handle it. If that happened, how much of a relapse could they handle? So again, if you're talking about hypersexual mode, there's a range of behaviors. So there's a big difference between stepping out and actually having sex with someone and mm -hmm. flirting with someone at a party. Yes. And the betrayed partner will have to decide where their boundaries are. This is something that's part of beginning work with a betrayed partner. Where are their boundaries? What do they uh, insist that the partner do to help them feel safe? And they should come up with a, a document that's clear right. as day. Right. Right. It's good. So yeah, yeah. So there's no um, assumptions going on. It's like this is it. That's this right. Kind of like the contract. You must do this. There. Yes. Mm. Yeah. If we want to stay together, you need to do these things. And some of those things are within twenty. Uh, I don't want you to have meetings alone with women, right? Without telling me first, right? Or with men or whomever, mm. without telling me first. I want to know ahead of time. Right. So th things like that, just to feel safe. Um, you know, situations where things have been going on in the workplace, um, some partners I know have asked their partner to leave that workplace and then that's been refused. Um, would that be one of those sort of real deal breakers or do you think? Sometimes it is. Mm. It, it depends if they've had if they've had affairs with like three different people at their workplace it's usually a deal breaker. Mm. Um, sometimes it, it's tough because as we know from the news, some people are in work environments, actors, musicians, mm. where that is where all of the affairs or the sex work is going on. So on, they can't exactly switch. Yes. Right? Then then they have to negotiate. Yeah. Again, you know, I think these it can also happen if, if you're extreme specialist in, in an area and there's only one place yes. in town where you can work. Then that, but yes, I, yes, I, I exactly. Know, yes, it's, it's absolutely. Situations in my personal kind of world where, um, yeah. and actually what's happened is that they end up partnering the person at work and them. So it's like they haven't, they've, they've sort of stopped the affair, but not really stopped the relationship is, is what I ended up sort of coming to mind, but yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, right. And, and, and in that case, like that would be, that would be a case where the partner should have access to the work email. They should have like all of those kinds of things. They should be allowed to drop by work. Yeah. You know, it's not, not to, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Just, yeah. just to feel like, okay, nothing's going on. Right. This is trans totally transparent now. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. And so moving on to the next question. Um, yeah. If the betrayal is by an autistic adult in a relationship, is there any variations mm -hmm. you'd make to treating a sexual addiction? Would you structure your approach any differently? Um, the only, I guess the, the only adjustment I would make is to, uh, use more exercises around building empathy. So doing uh, imagery rehearsal, like expression work, even uh, in videos of uh, really helping them with expressions so that they could know when their partner was upset or not upset. Mm -hmm. Role reversal exercises where you take them through maybe an imagery where they were betrayed so they can imagine what they may have felt. Um, you would do much more of that 
Right. So that they really developed a sense for what their partner's feeling. Okay. It actually yeah. strikes me that the the written component would be great for autistic adults as well because it's yes. complete thin writing and they're not yeah. having to um, assume anything from nonverbal communication or anything. It's just very clear. So Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah, as I'm sitting here, I'm just wondering sometimes whether in autism you're kind of getting that obsessive aspect to sex as a that's where what oh yes addiction is coming from so it's quite complicated but that's probably a topic for another day um yes yes yeah <laughs> yeah so, um yeah what hap- what is happening in schema and mode terms when people find themselves repeatedly drawn and we sort of talked about this already yeah repeatedly drawn to people who betray yeah. Um, you know, some people I've worked with, they would say every partner I've had since I'm 14 years old has cheated on me. Um, and this can be in excess of five people. So it is really a pattern. Um, yeah. And it's not to, I, 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 this is my question. I don't ask it to blame people, but it's, I feel there has to be something going on in that mode clash. Um, and also for no the question. person who is, Got, they sort of don't seem to be able to, in their healthy adult mode, create a learning that helps prevent them to select differently. Yeah. 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 Um, you know, it's, it's exactly what you're talking about, right? It's, it's, it's schema chemistry. Mm-hmm. Right? It's, these, it's these links to family. Oftentimes you'll see that there was a lot of cheating going on when they were growing up. And um, one of the parents in a sense, bottled or taught the children how to ignore it, right? Right, or not notice it. Right. So there's there's a lot of things usually in the history that has predisposed them to doing that. And and I think then looking at each relationship and and was there was there this feeling of I'm um, thinking of one patient where um, she just remembers always having this feeling like she wanted she just didn't want to work so hard she she wanted someone who would take care of her she was never taken care of before so that was part of it and then that's what they were offering and she would overlook other things over and over and over again right so we we just we just want to unpack um... each relationship would you say that overlooking is the mode? Like the mode in action is like, oh, you know, nothing going on there. Right. <laughs> right. It's, oh, it's a, right. Actually, well, yeah, one person I work with quite elderly and, and they talked about a lot of things that they ignored, like smell, perfumes on clothing, lipstick marks. And it's kind of like, yeah. Um, just, and I think that was the times as well, feeling like they couldn't leave, but it led to this whole, just really oh there's got to be some really good explanation for that until they're you know actually I think they were in their 80s and suddenly um they went on they kind of partnered with someone in a different country you know and left them oh wow wow yeah there's that sense of betrayal around um I ignored all that stuff for years and I stayed loyal to you and now in our later years You've literally yeah. abandoned me, and then all the secrets right. kind of came out. So it can be quite, right. well, it's a little bit conscious as well, but sort of like an unwritten deal that's being made between partners. Mm. There is right, and so right, and so right. That of that avoidance comes up in order to maintain the connection and to get the thing, the other things within the relationship that they want. Yeah. Um, but the of course there's that horrible price that they're paying yeah yeah and I think um that was actually a real case of betrayal trauma I'm just thinking that in terms of what I was working with there and um and just that you know for it to happen so late in life it was very very challenging yeah Yeah. oh yeah that's a heartbreak to 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 do Mm. have discovery happen when you're in your 80s Mm. oh my god but it also, yeah, and I think the, the breaking point was the publicness of it this time. So she also couldn't be wrapped mm. up in any way. And so then it was so deeply shaming, not only in the home, but outside of the home. Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. So 
Um, the last question on this, I can't see any coming up here. I'll try not to turn the sound on again. Um, what is, oh, okay. What is happening um, when one partner is seeking authentic companionate love and the other is not, but kind of is pretending? I know you've talked about it. I'm thinking maybe now it isn't actually pretending, but it's a mode that does that. And then there's a mode that does the other stuff. But anyway, exactly. Just to review that before we finish up. Yeah, I, th I think that that's exactly right. It's because it's it's not pretending. It's all they know. Hmm. And, um, it's, it's so with people with these um, hypersexual modes, you'll find once they're in treatment, they don't. It's it's actually quite sad. They don't even really know how to make a friendship. They don't they don't know how to have real intimacy. They mm -hmm. they want it, but they really have no idea what it's like. It's a foreign country. So it's not exactly pretending. Mm -hmm. Right. It's this seems like this is to me, this is what love is. Right. Um, and the other person, right, is seeking something more authentic and deeper and closer. Mm -hmm. So Yes. They're presenting what they think love is. Mm. And in your experience, when you've, I know you work very long term with some of your people with hypersexuality, yeah. can they yeah. move to a point where they can form authentic love and really yes. experience that? Mm. Yeah. I, I think it's one of the more, more satisfying parts of the work is to watch that happen. Mm -hmm. um, I have someone now I've been working with about 10 months and he's he was so shut down and detached. He, he can't even believe he missed the last seven years in his marriage where he's like, I never really realized my wife loved me. Like she really loves me. She loves me like, like it. It is just coming over him that he can be loved. This is what love feels like. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's absolutely. And they spend a lot of time talking and he uh, spends much more time exposing. Not so pretty parts of himself to her is honest about things even if she gets angry right. and is starting to see that that is what builds trust right. you know something he's never been exposed to before it's yeah. really that's quite something and to ten, watch and ten yeah months is, that's a pretty good outcome, yeah isn't it, for 10 months yeah yeah absolutely well, i have been telling everyone how amazing you are so <laughs> <That's> an example <laughs> Oh, well, thank you so much for coming on. And, um, you know, I'm lucky sure. that I get to spend time with you regularly, but um, <laughs> I've learned more today. And is there anything coming up that people can um, do more training with you, um, whether that's in the online space or conference space or anything you'd like to share? Yeah. Well, you know, I'm actually just getting together um, another big sort of we'll say a six module training on which which will be split up between sex addiction and really treating betrayal trauma so wow. soup to nuts from begin from beginning to end with some good practice exercises so that's going to come that'll probably come like right at the beginning of 2023 and uh wendy bahari and i are probably going to start an online community for betrayal trauma because we're constantly getting requests and they really need support um this is very little support for betrayed partners so right. i think we're, so we're going to be the, doing that we'll uh, announce in that the, in the client space there's that and for those of us who want to train more in um yeah. use the beautiful schema therapy approach to yeah. sexual addiction and betrayal trauma right. you've got training and um i know your yes. general addictions training is extremely helpful and so if anyone wants to oh, jump thank you. right now they they can grab that on the schema therapy <laughs> yeah line. but if this um sexual aspect and relationship aspects is more your thing 
I will definitely be doing it. I can't wait already. Um, <laughs> then we've got to wait till 2023. And I know how much work goes into these things, Liz, so I can imagine <laughs> you're putting together modules and videos and it's, it's a yeah. really comprehensive offering that you'll have for all of us. So thank you. Oh, okay. My pleasure. Yes. Happy to be all here. Right. Well, I'll say goodbye to everyone on Facebook and I'll just um, catch you up on the Zoom in a moment. But it's um, okay. Again, being great so thank you for being here with us liz thank you bye okay. everyone bye